Hey everybody, Matt Michaels here along with Sin City Steve, and we are here with the one and only Adrian Quest. What's up, brother? How you doing, man? What up, yo? How are you guys? It's oh, Sunday no. in pandemic, so I guess we're doing as good as we can. <laughs> Chilling. Right? <laughs> uh, speaking of that, how has that been for you in terms of you've gotten back to uh, doing some filming? Um, what is that? Have, has that been difficult adapting to an empty arena or is it just, uh, you know, same as usual, everything, you know, you just go out and perform as you can? you most definitely have to work uh, a different way. You know what I'm saying? So, so like you're missing the energy from the crowd, which like at some points of the matches, you feed off the energy of the crowd, especially if like right. it's, it's a part, uh, it's a part of like the match that has like crowd interaction. Like you kind of have to like take that out like completely. Like I have this part of a, uh, of the match where I like look to the crowd and I call out for the homies and like the whole crowd says for the homies, which I miss. And so like, I've had to like completely scrap that from my arsenal just cause I'll look stupid, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like I don't, I, I feel like I would, you know, cause it's like, I am always always like looking for that, you know? Sure. When um, I, when I do it, but it, you know, when you, when you talk about something like that, um, what in terms of your um your philosophy or the psychology of a match what does that do for stuff like um comeback spots you know the 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 stuff like you said the homie stuff that's something that's unique to you but all wrestlers you know have to go through cutoffs and comebacks and it's really hard with no crowd there to be a baby and try to come back. Do you have to use almost a little bit of your imagination to kind of just embrace the fact that, Hey, you know, or, or are you buying into the reality of what's going on? Basically. I would say buying into the reality of what's going on. You use like, uh, uh, your own energy, you know, like your root, like if it was um, like, how would I explain? Like your real fire that you have, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Like your, your own passion for, I don't know, the moment or, you know, stuff like that. But it is definitely hard, like to try to tap into that. It took me a few, few matches to like, really like get the, get the, the structure of how, how these matches are now. Definitely, yeah. man. And now recently, um, you've been a, a regular on NJPW Strong. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience working for NJPW. Uh, it's been beautiful, bro. Uh, since the age of 13, that was my dream company to go to. Awesome. And uh, so that's always been uh, my number one goal is to get my foot in the door with that company specifically. I've always been uh, infatuated with like the Japanese culture and Japanese wrestling. So I loved it, bro. Been loving it. That's awesome, man. And now obviously the, uh, the, the thing that um, really kind of stands out from what you said is that from the beginning, new Japan was the company that really kind of, you know, fueled the fire, if you will. Um, what, what was it? Was it the general culture or was it, you know, something in the work rate or the presentation? What really kind of drew you to New Japan as opposed to another another company? It was definitely the the aesthetic, like the the work rate. Like, so I, I was like watching those. By this time, there was YouTube, you know. I was a, a, tra uh, a video trade taper, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but I had YouTube, fortunately. So, like, I would see, like, the J-Cup matches where it's like, Hayabusa versus Jushin Thunder Liger or like you know what I'm saying oh yeah like those types of matches like Great Sasuke and uh, like Black Tiger of course uh you know all those dudes yep yeah so like uh, just the, the aesthetic of how they were presented and how how it almost seemed like a street fighter like like tournament you know I sure. yeah yeah so that's how I seen it you know awesome man Wh what was it like for you you started at a very young age, you know, like you said, um, not only were you, uh, was it your goal, but you 
facilitated, uh, you know, by starting to, to work at 11 in ring and training. Right. What was it like for you to have a Jesse Hernandez as the mentor, as the trainer, and B, to put on a lucha mask at 13 and go into the ring in front of a crowd and wrestle your first match? Uh, yeah, like Jesse Hernandez is definitely like my Mr. Miyagi, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> as far as like <laughs> putting on a mask, I, I felt more comfortable and probably putting on a mask just because I, I was a real shy kid in general. You know, I was, I was real shy, but I loved pro wrestling. And it was just like, it was real nerve wracking, bro. It was real nerve wracking. I remember my first show was at this like church. It was like this church event for some reason. And like, <laughs> yeah, and so like, and it was like all filled with like kids. And it was like, it was crazy. Cause some of them were like my age and it was just like a weird, you know, it was like a weird, like, it was like a weird thing where it's like, it's not normal at all, you know? But. Well, that's that. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense in terms of that, you know, that's not a, a reality that most people get a chance to um, experience, especially like you said, in front of kids, your own age. Um, did, do you, what, ha what happened between the first match that you had, and like you said, you were shy as a kid and developing into the Adrian Quest persona, what was your biggest steps getting over that shyness and being able to develop a character that is, you know, pretty confident and a little bit of cockiness to it, which is awesome. Right. So I would say I was, I was shy only in the sense of like, because you're working with a bunch of like, older people that know what they're doing and like I was very like I knew that I was real young so I was like real shy to like even like saying hi to like all these dudes that I would have to work with you know and it was just like but like at home or at home or like or at school I was definitely not shy I was like actually a real bad kid I was you know <laughs> but uh um I'm sorry <laughs> my, my I'm, brain, I'm not I blanked out but Wait, I'm not. I'm not gonna let you get. I'm not gonna let you get past that one. What is the worst thing that you did as a real bad kid? <laughs> These are so many. Um, <laughs> let me. Let me. Let me see. Um, there's so so much. I can't really pinpoint what was the worst thing I've done, but uh, even like like when like I would ha like my mom would make me go to church like as a kid. You know, like I couldn't like just like sit still and just like stand up, sit up, like like I would have to do something mischievous. Like I'd like go underneath the seat. And this is when I was like real young, like five or six. Like I'd go underneath the seats, like start looking in like other women's purses for gum or candy. Like, or you know, like or I'd like pull their hair like behind the chair and then like dip, you know, stuff like that. I was I was a terrible kid, bro. Ryan. <laughs> I just love the idea that it was a church. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what what has it meant to you to get a chance to um, tag with Andy Brown? And um, mm. does do you know you've been tagging for a little while? Has the um, right. chemistry that you guys um, you know have in the ring now? Did it take a while to develop? Um, and were you more so uh, focused on wanting to be a singles wrestler and then the opportunity just happened where they had nothing else for you and for Andy and you guys kind of came together? Uh, before we even, like, tagged, we, like, had real good chemistry, like, at, on, like, training matches and stuff like that. Um, so like I, I feel like the but there was like a um we had chemistry I would say like against each other at first like working right. with each other but uh, against each other I should say but like when it came to like when we first got as a tag team it was it was actually really like because we had totally different ideas of like what we wanted to do and so sure. but after a while we like kind of like uh learned to um what to cut out like or what like he or she 
he or me or me should cut out uh, for each other. You know what I'm saying? So just learning how to work with each other, you know? So the, I would say that working as a tag chemistry wasn't there right away, but yeah. you just work at it, you know? Yeah, definitely, man. Um, and obviously, I mean, you've worked extensively for, you know, championship <laughs> wrestling from Hollywood. You've appeared on primetime live. Uh, right. We've had David Marquez on the show and he's been a great visionary for years. Um, right. Talk to us a bit about what it's been like to work for Mr. Marquez. It's been dope, man. He's a, uh, he's, he's uh, has a good eye for, for people he wants to like bring in and um, you know, just how he, how he carries himself, you know, how he, how he cares for uh, the guys he brings in. So it's pretty cool, bro. He's a nice, nice guy. Awesome, man. Do you, do you get a chance um, when you're, you know, hanging around uh, all day uh, to observe and kind of take in what's going on on the production aspect of, uh, you know, a tape day? Is that something that interests you or are you just, more focused just on the in-ring work itself uh like the production side not so much um i do have like uh, an interest in helping uh train people i like to like when people like at training so i'd say mostly the in-ring work is where is where my interest is at and how long did it take for you to um develop the or i shouldn't say develop but get to understand the layout of a match and the psychology that goes into it did it take you a while to really have it click and was there a particular moment or match that you realized oh, okay now all this stuff i've been learning for x amount of time makes sense to me right most definitely like it did take some time just because i because when i uh the business had grown so differently from the time I was 11 years starting to train to like when I got back into wrestling at uh, 18 or 19, I think it was. Uh, Cause I took a three year break after like from, I, no, I'm sorry, from like 16 to 18, I took a break from pro wrestling. I was in high school. I was just doing the high school thing. I was like skateboarding and stuff like that. Uh, partying. Uh but like when I came back into the business, it was totally different. Like I was about 19 when I started training again and started doing matches again. It was, uh, it was like more of like the, I wouldn't say not there yet, but it was starting to get to like where it's like you have, uh, you need to do something for the gifts or, you know, stuff like that. So I was first for a while there, I was like trying to adjust to like being like doing a style where it was just like, all right, just go out and do everything you can. You know, and then it clicked uh, as I just got older, like I started learning things, you just learn. But I think a point where it clicked is when I develop, developed the thing for um, for the homies thing, you know, whereas like that, that's my uh, biggest reaction in a match. You know, I wouldn't say my biggest and it depends on match by match, you know, but like that's a part where it's like the the people who do go to see me, that's the, the moment they they wait for you know, so they could have that real big crowd involvement part of the match where it's like they feel like they're part of the match, you know? Sure. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're just starting out, the best thing is having a support base around you. Were there or are there um, particularly, you know, like friends or family members who come to see you and if so does that you know uh, do you do you find that where you um when you're working you actually you know get a glimpse of them and sometimes it just kind of can throw you <laughs> when you see right. like you know oh shit you know my you know my grandma's in the audience in front row you know I think it throws me off when I see actual family, just cause I'm like, ah, it's my family. Like, I know I'm gonna hear that at the next family barbecue, like, uh, you know, like, cause you know, they're not like a pro wrestler. So they're gonna try to tell you what you did wrong in the match or something, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's like, oh, you shouldn't have slammed it. You know, they're just like, ah, like, shut up, you know? 
but like <laughs> when it's uh friends i would say it's totally different because it's like uh especially with like when i was like when i would party a lot like i was like kind of like the crazy one of the of the group you know where it's like the most energetic so uh so it's probably like that part is just fun because then now they just see me on like a whole nother level of like energy uh when it comes to wrestling but yeah pretty much that yeah definitely man and now something else that's that's really noteworthy. I mean, I, I see the beanie. You've got your own clothing line called Bermuda. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and uh, what prompted you to create it. So I grew up, um, like, probably when I was, like, I grew up with not much, you know? So, like, like a lot of, like, the people in the industry come from nothing, you know? So, um, so when I was about, like, in seventh grade, uh I found this website called Tumblr and Tumblr would show you like a bunch of streetwear, like, or like just depending on what you're into, like, you know, but like I came across like streetwear and then just falling in love with streetwear and then uh, trying to find brands that I could like afford or like, you know, sometimes like my older sister would like buy me like a shirt or something, but like, I just really got heavy into streetwear and wanting to like, wanting more, like, uh, and wanting to be a part of that, like, scene you know so as I got into high school like I would go like to like different like like streetwear pop-ups and stuff like that or like I would do the like waiting in line at Supreme when I was in high school or like uh <laughs> the hundreds and stuff like I did all that you know uh went to a lot of hip-hop shows where you would exchange like oh you got that I got this you know like type thing but uh when I was in high school like I had had the idea to actually want to start my own brand I came up with the name in high school and all that. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I blanked out. Yeah, so I came up with the name in high school and all that, but I just didn't know how to start it uh, yeah. until I got out of high school and I actually like got a job at like a screen printing place and stuff like that. I just learned how to like cut out the middleman pretty much. That's what, pretty uh, dumb, man. what does Bermuda stand for? <laughs> so it's like conquering the fear of the own of the unknown so it's something like you could relate to like you know in like in like uh in the the name itself like the bermuda triangle you know like people don't know what they're getting into once they pass it but for me it's more so like as a kid like everything was like uh, tomorrow was unknown of like oh we're we gonna get kicked out of the apartment or you know like stuff like that or so like it was just like uh it's pretty much to me, it's conquering the fear of the unknown, you know? And it's like for, for people that grew up like me, pretty much, it's who I try to uh, attract to. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned uh, skateboarding. Uh, <laughs> are you still skateboarding? And if so, what's your go to board? Uh, definitely a Baker. A Baker, Baker skateboards. Yeah, my, my favorite brand growing up. Um, no, I do not anymore just because I have so much on my plate. And then if I were to really be committed to, like, skateboarding, I'd probably hurt myself. And, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm no Darby Allen, you know. I can't just fall 20 feet and get right back up. Like, I, I started training at 11, so I'm, I'm feeling bumps from, like, when I was 12, you know. So, Bump no, I definitely don't early. skate anymore, you know. Like, I can't uh, – like I just, it's just too much energy to put in to like, to put in at, at an age like this where I have so much else going on, you know. Right. I would, that would be dope if I could, but no, I it just it's out of the question now. Who who was your uh, favorite uh, skateboarder, um, and why was it Tony Hawk? <laughs> it, it was not Tony Hawk, <laughs> but uh, like. As a kid, we play uh, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, of course, but I loved Kareem Campbell. And then yeah. as I got a little bit older, it was uh, Omar Salazar. Yeah, definitely. That's a good choice. Um, do, do you think that, you know, when you think about um, coming up with the, the character and the culture, do you think that if you were to go, let's say New Japan um, wants you to go, you know, tomorrow over to Japan to, to wrestle, but they want you to, you know, be um, 
or <laughs> Dragon Master or something, you know, create yeah. just some totally different persona. What would be the difficulties for you to transition from the character you are now to something that's just totally different and opposite of who you are? All right. Um, there would be definitely a little change, but I don't, it's pro wrestling. So you got to learn how to adapt, you know? So adaptability, I think, is like like a big part of like this industry, you know? Yeah, learn how to adapt. So uh, I would just adapt, honestly. But I know there's like a lot of marketability, more marketability uh, for what I'm doing now because I could right. attract people who are like me, you know, into the business of pro wrestling. Like I want to be the dude that's like uh, that puts people on to like like so pretty much I want to be the front man for the dude that's too afraid to say he likes pro wrestling and for him to be like you know what i mean like he don't yeah. want to tell his homies like oh i watch pro wrestling on the low you know what i'm saying <laughs> for him to be like proud of it because it's like no look at this dude this dude's into everything i am and then like i want to be a representative for you know those dudes right and how is it uh you know working with guys like um let's say danny danny limelight who mm-hmm. You know, in the same way, it kind of uses um, his heritage um, for, you know, his character. Um, Is there, I mean, do you, do you see similarities in guys who use um, either their nationality or their upbringing or their street cred to what you're doing? Um, Yes and no. As far as like the nationality part, like, yeah. But I feel like there's no one in pro wrestling like me, you know, there's not like, there's not like the streetwear dude that's been into like skateboarding into like all types of different things. Like, uh, so like, yeah, like yes and no, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely, man. And I mean, there's, there's other wrestlers that do wear streetwear, but there's not like, I'm like, like in the game, I've studied the game. I've been, you know, like in, in high school, I was like at all these like events, you know what I'm saying? Like, and like sure. all of those dudes in the streetwear world do, don't, do not fuck with wrestling. You know what I'm saying? And if they do, it's like, oh, I got this vintage Stone Cold Steve Austin <laughs> shirt. Like, yeah, I remember the Undertaker, <laughs> Rey Mysterio, like Rey Mysterio, the dude with the man, you know, like, so it, it's that when you go into that world, like, you know what I'm saying? Some, some, maybe some of them like watch wrestling, but like, I would like, like 99 percent of them don't you know or they're like oh like i I could resell you this old stone cold steve austin shirt for like 800 bucks you try to buy it you know so that's wrestling in that that aspect definitely man now you you actually bring up a, a really great point with that um now obviously we're at a time where to be honest um the wrestling product Um, is more accessible than it's ever been. Uh, You have so many different companies with so many different distribution platforms and, you know, all these different ways of, of taking in the product. Um, Do you think that we're finally on the cusp of, you know, mainstream kind of breaking through again, or do you think that that's that ship has sailed and we're not going to get mainstream again? No, I, I do believe, uh, especially with everything going on right now, like, there's so many there's so much wrestling right now so it's like it's almost unavoidable if you're like even like if you're like scrolling through channels it says like uh, ring of honor impact wrestling you know like aew rest you know like WWE, and everyone knows WWE, you know but they'll see like an impact and then wrestling you know so everything has like a wrestling yeah. attachment to it so like when you look it up on you know like when you're scrolling down the tv guide or whatever you know so i feel like th- there's a even bigger boom coming you know which yeah, would be dope definitely. for for like everyone in the industry and then outside of it. That's like that brings more more eyes onto wrestling, where we wrestling like could collaborate with different brands and different things, like like AEW and Clorox. You know, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying that's like an example that like, that probably would never happen. But like you know what I'm saying, like it's like you know like whatever like new japan and monster collab and you know, or red bull collab you know like it just opens eyes you know like because you know it'd be dope to see another boom pro wrestling another major boom i'd say like where it's almost pop culture again you know 
Yeah. What, um, for you, what has it been like in terms of um, training a, in the gym itself and trying to transform your body into, you know, uh, a, a body type that a company like New Japan is now interested in, uh, you know, taking you on and allowing you to wrestle. Do you spend, you know, five days a week or what is a typical training regimen like for you, man? Regimen for me for a company like New Japan is conditioning because you're in with the, the best in the world. Like literally New Japan Pro Wrestling has the best athletes in the world. Like as far as like wrestling goes, you know, like their conditioning is A1. So conditioning is always something I'm like trying to get like really, really, really like deep into because you're wrestling with the best in the world, you know? And what was it like for you during your high school years um, being a, um, a mat wrestler? Um, you know, I, I had experience in mat wrestling and found that the translation into a pro wrestling ring um, was definitely helpful. Of course, you had a little experience of pro wrestling before you got into high school itself. Right. Was that an odd transition to go from, you know, a, a work to an actual shoot? Right. It was definitely like a learning curve, but like, I would say both of them helped each other out. It's like, so like some of my pro wrestling's, like things I've learned from pro wrestling definitely helped me with like high school wrestling yeah. or that type of like wrestling, the mat wrestling. So, and then like vice versa, you know, so it just, they just ended up helping each other out. Like, so when I did go back to, to pro wrestling, uh, I learned how to like move my body better, better, how to uh, make certain moves look more realistic uh, in the ring. Yeah. Did, did you find when you, were um wrestling in high school did you find that or was there ever a time that you were in the middle of the match let's say it's third period and things are coming down the wire where you had the audience energy help you feel a comeback for a win or you know did did you ever experience that because i know that was one of the things that I actually fed off of when I was, you know, a kid wrestling and you hear the crowd and you just get so pumped up because there's so much behind you. You get that last adrenaline, you throw, you know, a headlock, right. something like that. And then all of a sudden you pin them and, and you win. Did you ever not have that, like that? Not that I could remember, to be honest. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, I don't... Uh, a lot of those like matches, you have like your meets where it's just like the one mat and it's the school versus school. But uh, for the most part, I did like the tournaments, you know, like I mean, like, well, I did all of them. But like from what I remember most was like the tournaments where it was like uh, where it was like it was like eight mats and then there's eight different matches going on at once. So it's like those ones like I couldn't even like really hear my coaches speak, you know, yeah. there's, there's like so much going on, like everyone's in the gym and it's like, you know. There's like there's eight different whistles blowing, you know. Yeah. So it's like, so those were just like kind of more like your own instinct. And and what's really funny about that is, I always found it it, it was just a strange feeling of your period ends. Let's say it's the end of the first or second period, and you're getting up. And as you're getting up, like you look and there's someone getting you know pinned over here. There's someone yeah. starting over there and it's just the weirdest feeling because you want to keep your focus, but at the same time, there's so much shit going around you. It's crazy. And you're right. You can barely hear, you know, what your coaches are saying and, and you got three different whistles going off at the same time. That's craziness. Did you at any time realize that that chaoticness, that, you know, that um, atmosphere actually helps you you know when you get into a pro wrestling ring in the sense that you know how to focus in now right does, the, yeah, does that make sense 
yeah it definitely like because i'm someone who likes pressure like if there's no pressure on me then it, it it's probably like gonna be like average you know so i always put pressure yeah. on myself in every situation so so that helps me like zone in really and really like tap in into what i'm doing is just putting pressure on myself to like like you know just put, putting myself in scenarios where just like where it's like oh if you don't do this right then this is gonna happen you know so I, it, it's it's a good and bad way to think but yeah i definitely just put pressure on myself and definitely. i think Steve, you got you got the most, and as we wrap up here, you got the most important question. Oh yeah, I, without question, man, it's it's the most important question that I'm going to ask you today. And Adrian, right. obviously, you're a huge Dodgers fan. How great was it for you, as a fan, to experience them winning the World Series in 2020 of all years? It was dope, but what wasn't dope was not being able to celebrate. And like, I, I seen everyone everyone uh going out and like you know like partying and stuff like that it's like oh, i want to party so bad but we're in a pandemic and i have to keep like like myself safe so that way the people around me are safe and, exactly you know like i have to prep for like wrestling matches and stuff like that so it's like i can't do these matches if i have covid you know so it's like it was super dope though like it was it was just like a cool time because uh like these past few years we got so close, you know? Yeah. It was and, dope, bro. It just, I just wish I could celebrate and, you know, party right. with, with everyone and stuff like that. Yeah. And hope, hopefully, you know, once everything, you know, once everything kind of subsides, I mean, we can get back to some shred of normalcy. Right. Most definitely. Hopefully and soon, man. To you, uh, are you like me where the Dodger dogs are the hot dog or do you uh, not buy into the Dodger dog hype? Uh, I don't, honestly, I don't. And it's <laughs> not that it's like a bad one. I just, I, I don't even really eat hot dogs in general. Like I do, you know, but it's not like it, it to me, it's just another, like it's just another hot dog, but it's not the elite hot dog. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> that's one question <laughs> hey man i listen um i did um uh, it was a uh a thing that had tommy lasorda and it, he was um doing a, a like a q a a sit down and um there was probably about 30 of us it was a very exclusive group at dodger stadium and um, I afterwards had gone in to use the restroom. And as I came out, I see Tommy as he's getting ready to leave. And I talked to him for a little bit. But the coolest thing about Tommy was he downed like six Dodger dogs. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he's basically walking out, you know, eating a, a Dodger dog. And it's like, man that's the life to be a uh, a hero to uh, many fans to get paid to go to an event and to get your favorite you know your favorite yeah. food handed to you that's just amazing um when you think about yourself uh and that potential of being becoming uh someone who is known um throughout you know, the country would be the best throughout the world would be amazingly mm. best, but just amongst the community in LA, do you think that if you were able to get enough tension, enough, um, I don't want to say fame in a negative way, but enough notoriety that you would be able to give back to the community? And does that mean something to you? Most definitely. And that time will definitely come. I know, I know it will definitely uh, come. And that's one thing, yes, I want to do. Um, there's actually, I live in uh, San Bernardino County, actually. And San Bernardino is uh, one of the highest, has one of the cri highest crime, actually the highest crime rate in California. So, it, and it's like, there's a lot of pro poverty within San Bernardino. So it'd be, it'd be dope to like, give back to like schools in San, within the San Bernardino County. You know, just whether whether it may be like because a lot of those kids don't 
they don't have like good Christmases, for example, you know, right. to like just be able to donate and like, but like, because I'm not a cheap gift giver anyways, like to like have all these like dope expensive toys from Playstations to, you know, like stuff like that to like just give out for free, you know, to like people who are like, you know, less, yeah. the less fortunate, you know. Well, I think that's an awesome, uh, you know, uh, thing to shoot for. Um, mm -hmm. For the people who uh, might not follow you on social media and might see this, where can they find you? Um, what are your handles? And uh, is there any place they can uh, see your matches and um, maybe get your merchandise as well? Right. So I do not have my own personal wrestling merchandise right now just because I focus on my, my brand itself. But um, sure. um, you could follow me at, on Twitter and Instagram at Adrian underscore quest. That's both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, Facebook, I really don't use. Uh, it's kind of like whatever's for me. Uh, but as far as my brand, that's B-U-R-R-M-U-D-A underscore. And that's on uh Twitter and Instagram as well. And then they could buy stuff from, from, from Bermuda at bermudaofficial.com. Excellent. And of course they can see you on the United Wrestling Network uh, right. and, uh, and New Japan world for sure. And new Japan world. So, right. um, you know, I can't say enough about you uh, in terms of, you know, being as young as you still are and um, you know, learning the business at an even younger age um it looks like things are coming together for you and it's okay. yeah it's amazing to see brother and we appreciate you taking the time and hopefully today we're able to uh get the word out and maybe you know pick you up a, a new fan or two for life so most definitely appreciate that's, it bro. that's what we're here to do brother and you know continued success and uh you know, we'll check back in with you uh, down the line, brother. Word. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Start appreciate it, brother. You.